Alma, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hello, Alma. Hello, Anna. Hello, everyone. Hello, so, our, uh, our dear visitors. I'll uh, introduce my friend Alma Svensson. She's uh, my friend and she is a researcher of ceramic 3D printing. And today she will be speaking about the role of the designer in the digital fabrication world about uh, hopefully her self-built uh, ceramic 3D printer and the work she's done recently. So I'm really hoping to, to listen to you at the very moment. Um, I'll also share some links on other events of our Urban Modularity project, which is dedicated to 3D printing of ceramics and other paste and application of this technology in the city context. Um, also, this program is connected to our uh, Masters in Prototyping Future Cities. I also share a link in a moment. So if you're interested in getting a Master's degree in Prototyping Cities, this is, this is the program for you. Um, Alma, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you could begin. <laughs> yeah, I should begin. Let's do it. Okay, I don't know if I, uh, I'm just going to start. Let me know if I should turn off the video, if the quality with the sound or something is bad, right? Okay, yeah, again, my name is Alma. I'm from uh, Copenhagen. I'm an architect. I graduated last year um, um, from the program from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts called Computation and Architecture, where we work with uh, digital design and digital fabrication and how to you know, make, make new methods, use new methods and so on within the architectural world. Um, so what I will be talking to you about today will be, uh, first of all, I will talk a little bit about uh, state of the art within 3D printing in architecture and um, where things are at the moment. Um, and from that, I will discuss a little bit why I chose um, the column as an architectural component um, for me to explore this method of fabrication um, in an architectural context. Um, and from that, I will uh, tell you about my own work, the tool making, building my render, um, different uh, or the, the method kind of that I developed for generating tool paths. Um, and in the end, I will show you the column that I made, my own one to one demonstration of uh, an architectural component, you can say, um, and talk to you about like my experiments and the investigations I did when doing that. So, to begin with, uh, 3D printing and architecture and like where it, where it is at the moment and for a couple of years now we've seen um, multiple examples of uh, 3D printed structures. This one is from X3 in, in Paris. Um, this one is uh, this one no, just a second, is from Epis Core, uh, which is an American company uh, that are really doing a lot at the moment. Um, so we've seen these kind of experimental structures where the where the method method is just kind of scaled up, um, but for it to be like really applied uh, as uh, as a way we actually build uh, our homes and our buildings and so on, um, there are, there have been these kind of um, ideas about just doing very very large uh, 3D printing setups where you have these uh, large frames and then you can just can actually just kind of scale it up as you'd as you'd like uh, so for example this one or this one all renderings trying to kind of uh, imagine how that setup could look and using a setup like that uh, there has been built or 3d printed you know the first uh, the first full building you can say uh, here in Copenhagen and this is the first building to be 3d printed in Europe um, and it's here in Copenhagen and um, something I want to mention in, in this context is that this building, for example, is in the kind of like a, a no man's land close to the harbor 
because because of the legislation here in uh, Denmark, even if we had technology to just print all our homes, the like the legislation is not there yet. So you're not actually allowed to do it. They were just allowed to make it. So uh, yeah, that that's a thing within architecture, right? That you can't just you can't just necessarily do exactly what you want. You have some rules that you need to follow and so on. Um, and this is the building from from the inside. This is actually a girl who was in my <laughs> old old master's program. She helped uh, design this one. Um, then there is this uh, project by Epis Core, the American company, and this is in uh, Dubai, where they are starting to build, or they are actually building the the largest three D printed building that has been printed so far. Um, the Danish company that I mentioned before, they are also working in Dubai now because of the legislation, because Dubai you can kind of do what you want and there's a lot of money and so on. <laughs> so in this case, um, this company, Episcore, they built it, or they printed the, the largest 3D printed building that has ever been made yet. And the next step for them, and you can see this is, this is kind of how it looks uh, from the outside also. Um, and the next step for them is to start um, is to start 3D printing in uh, in Louisiana in the U.S. So things are kind of evolving like that. You can see they are using a different method than we saw before with the large setup. They are, they have this uh, robotic arm that has a like a center, and then they will move the printer to build different parts of the building, which means that you can you're not necessarily uh, constrained to the dimensions of the printer. You can just move the printer around and of course that needs a lot of control and a lot of planning and so on, but that's a way to do things like this. Um, and they are, they, they are really good at it. It's very controlled, it's very clean. Of course you could argue that they are not getting the benefits from 3D printing by controlling everything so much, like um, the level of, of articulation, detail that you can get from don't really see here like this this is a building that could that could easily have been uh, built by other methods with the concrete or you know bricks and plaster and so on so these are kind of the ones leading the field at the moment i would say um but you could argue that they are not getting as much from the method as could as would be possible um and also the same company uh, participated in NASA's 3D printed habitat competition last year, where there were a lot of um, a lot of different companies who uh, submitted their ideas for how uh, an architecture in space that was 3D printed could look. Because one of the benefits from 3D printing is that you can take the material that you have on site and you can kind of uh, feed the machine with the material that you that you have. So this is the same company that we saw before. This is their a submission for this uh, NASA competition that was last year. Um, also, the fact that uh, companies like like NASA is interested in the in this kind of fabrication method means that there will be money going into um, into this fabrication method, and the money is what is needed kind of for the for the progress to happen. So that's a good thing. Um, then we see other examples here, for example, this one by Michael Hansmeier, where we really see how articulated 3D printed um, like spaces could look. And where the other companies were like very clean and very under articulated, you could argue that this is maybe, you know, pushing it. <laughs> this is like, it's good to see what it can do, but it, it's a lot, you know. <laughs> and uh, but. Again, it's an example of how articulated the other buildings that we just saw could have been. Um, one last thing. What we see in these other examples is kind of one homogenous um, building taking place. So you, you have your setup, you do your whole building, typically in concrete. So it's just one mass and it makes it very hard to, for example, work with um, strategies like design for disassembly, where you can make components, you can put them together, you can take them apart later on, reuse them in, a, in an alternative setting, and so on. Um, 
but we also see examples of 3D printed modular space spaces. This one, for example, by Virgin Objects, or here, where this is from uh, the IAC, uh, the Open Thesis Replication Program that they have, um, where they are uh, doing uh, components in this case. This is now bricks um, made from a, a thermal uh, simulation. And that's also something that when you start working with clay, you can start to take these into account because it's much more porous and much more kind of a live material that can provide some different thermal and uh, yeah, thermal qualities. And something that's really interesting also in the way that, that they work, I think, uh, at I the open application program is that they they are implementing this idea that with 3D printing you can 3D print something with uh, with very thin layers, then you can actually see it in that in that scale. As for example, here they are doing uh, you know some science like how could this look? They're kind of trying to combine the 3D printed clay with uh, a wooden structure, um, and from that, then they can do small uh, explorations how this could look, and like like we normally do as architects. Um, we will design something with make a smaller model of it, see how it looks, how will the light be, all these things. Um, and with 3D printing, you can use actually the same tool to do your scale models and your one-to-one -one models. Um, so for example, here, what we see here is what we also see here, but in a one-to-one -one, um, in a one -to -one scale. So I think that's something that's really interesting as well with this fabrication method, that you can get the same kind of uh, detail and articulation on different scales as well. Um, and next up, having um, or working with 3D printing is that you can start embedding different functionalities. And especially when you're working with clay, which has different um, different properties, heat or humidity, like uh, yeah, clay can contain heat and then it can release it later on and stuff like this, which is the reason why we've been building with clay for so long, is that you can start, when you design for 3D printing, you can start embedding functionality directly that you want to do. Uh, some other examples where this is, has been applied is, for example, the cool brick by Imagine Objects, this um, project that has like a, an air cooling brick system. And then there is this other one on the left, uh, which is uh, an, an installation. It's not 3D printed, but it's an installation by Ant Studio where they have these clay vessels, which makes a, an evaporative cooling system. So you don't need any air conditioning in the room. The water will just go into the clay and then slowly uh, evaporate to the room and kind of managing uh, the inner climate to that room. Now I will start talking about the column, uh, an architectural component. And the column as an architectural component is something that we kind of all know and can relate to. It's something that um, is kind of, um, I don't know, gen generative for an architectural project because depending on the size of the column and the height of the column, um, the room will, will be in a certain way. So the column kind of determines how the room is going to, uh, is going to end up and how the organization of the room, the height of the room, et cetera. And there is also this modularity to the column. You see here on the right by Constantin Francuzzi, the endless, the endless column that you can just keep adding modules if you wanted to. Um, so I chose this as my kind of um, you know, space to explore uh, the method. And we also have already seen some examples of um, modular columns that have been 3D printed. We have the, the example on the left by Olivia Van Hat, uh, and then which is 3D printed clay, and the example on the right by Michael Hansmeier, uh, is, which is called the subdivided column, is 3D printed plastic. Um, and this is, again, it's from 2010, the one on the right. So it's kind of quite, a, quite an old project, but still these are some of the examples that we've seen um, and kind of the possibilities for 3D printing a column. Um, and now this project, uh, where we, it's from uh, Itzha Stulik, 
where they have made like a whole series of 3D printed uh, 3D printed concrete columns. Uh, and I think the, I think the work is really nice. I think it's really beautiful. But it's um, it's again this idea that you print something very heavy, very you know, it is what it is when it's printed, and you can't really take it apart or do anything else with it because of the material pro properties of concrete. So now the things that I kind of uh, figured that I needed to to control or get into or find my way through was the tool and the tool path and the material. So for me as as a designer or as an architect, these are the things that I need to become familiar familiar with, right? In order to do the designs that, that I wanted. Um, so first of all, I will talk about the tool and the 3D printer that I built. And that takes me back to when I started 3D printing, where I met the uh, Ensign <laughs> in the uh, Salon uh, a couple of years ago, where we just uh, tried out a lot, of, a lot of different things. And in this context, um, I, I I found out that people uh, were doing their own 3D printers. This was actually something people did, and also students. And it was actually a very um, acceptable thing to do. And in like in, in old times, it was very normal that you, as a designer or as, or as an architect, or making stuff, you would normally always do your own setup. You would always be the one doing the setup that you needed for the specific project that you were doing. Um, so I started to look into different people who had uh, or built 3D printers before. This is Jonathan Key. Um, who built a 3D printer in 2014, as Anson also mentioned at the lecture. This is uh, an example by Olivier van Hert, a Dutch artist. And um, I then started <laughs> to do my own 3D printer. This was the very first uh, picture, kind of like, okay, how big is it going to be? What, what's going to happen? Like, just, yeah, going into it and then building the parts, designing the parts. Um, I bought my uh, extruder head from Wasp, but all of the other parts were aluminum handmade made. Um, and designing, yeah, designing the different, uh, different parts, doing the electronic setups. Uh, and in the end, this is the, the machine that I, that I built. You don't see the container for the clay, but this is the machine that I ended up building that is approximately two meters high-ish, so you can print um, something around 50 centimeters in diameter and 50 centimeters in height. Um, and doing this made it very easy later in the process to change things about the machine when I needed to do so, or change the settings, or just really be very familiar with, with this tool, not be, I don't know, <laughs> intimidated by going into this kind of, of process. And this was the first successful, successful print <laughs> that I did on my machine. And I built the machine for uh, my thesis project, uh, which was a year ago. And when when I then built the machine, there was um, there was a thing that, that was kind of a next step, which is that when you do 3D printing, you do digital modeling create the G-code, you 3D print it, then you can evaluate your print and you can go back to remodel it because when you design your, your prints, it will it will typically not look like you did it digitally. Like you do something digitally and then um, you print it and it looks completely different and you go back and you model it again and you see like how and you'll be surprised positively and negatively <laughs> in different kind of uh, ways, but that's kind of how how it works. Um, and then, um, because of that, the way we normally the way we normally um, make G codes is that we do a solid geometry, uh, which can be readable for any kind of slicing software. From that, we slice the geometry into layers of uh, some kind of uh, automatically then generated toolpath, 
And the end result would be that it's kind of difficult, difficult to control exactly where the, the 3D printer is going to go. And therefore it is limiting kind of the freedom and the control that we that we need to have in order to design uh, exactly what we are that we are for. Um, so and uh, an alternative additive manufacturing process is that you you don't you don't draw or you don't do the solid in your 3D program. You don't do the solid. You model the exact curve that you want the 3D printer to follow, and um, so it becomes very uh, easy to control exactly where the machine is going to go. And from that, um, you can then custom made your G codes, um, which means that that you curve that you drew for the machine to follow is divided into points and all of these points will then act as the as the base for the um, I will also share with you later the and this is made in Grasshopper and I will share with you the, the script, the Grasshopper script um, that I made and then you can take a look at it and we can have another chat at some point or something if anyone is interesting in kind of doing things this way instead and trying this out. Um, so from that, then that means that now this is, this is the column that I, or like a small part of the column that I made. It's two meters in total uh, and it consists of 11 elements. Um, but the interesting thing now is that because we changed the way that we built or the way that things are being produced, we also change the way that we draw, like we can't draw things in the same way that we that we usually did. So for example, the drawing for this one, like my, my digital drawing for this, ended up looking like this. So that what you actually see, uh, yeah, and sure, if you have any questions, ask, ask, ask. But, um, or just stop me if it's going too fast, too slow or anything. <laughs> but um, this is, this is the drawing of the of the columns, so though. We don't see uh, a solid, which is actually the final product. We don't see a solid anymore. We see um, all the curves that this solid solid consists of. And now onto the design, designing the column. These are some of my initial uh, sketches. Like, how could this a modular, modular system, how could it kind of look and just, okay, there are so many possibilities. Um, the printer that I, there's a question, should we do questions in the end? Which do, should we do questions? I think. <laughs> we will do questions in the end. Um, and so this is, the, this is the column that I made. It consists of a uh, 11 elements that uh, has uh, an info structure that I designed and then they go on top of each other and has um, a theme um, where they kind of overlap each other. And so um, the three things that I uh, focused on when designing this um, was the info structure because that's something that we that we usually have, or that's something that some kind of soft software will usually generate for us when we do 3D printing. Then the, the surface expression of, uh, of the column, and then also the intersection of the different modules. Um, and to begin with, with the, the infill structure, this is actually um, a design that, the, the idea for this design came when we were at the workshop in Berlin. Uh, me and the, another guy, Johan, who was in the workshop, we had this idea of having a, having an info structure where it would be just just with the just within the edge or like the shell of the object that you were 3D printing, and then when when that shape would change, the info structure could change with it, but only uh, around the edges, and. This is just like a, a graphic of how that is done. You only, you only draw the outline of the object that you want to make. And from that, these circles are generated within that shell. And you can see this as each layer of the 3D printed uh, module will end up looking like this. But 
it will change in the in diameter like the outer diameter of the thing will change and so will the circle change as well um, and then this uh, a part of the outer uh, a part of the outer layer will then change into being able to move completely freely so these were some uh, tests that I did where I just said uh, you can move freely you have a path you have like a base path which is just a clean cylinder um, but then from that you can move completely, completely free right um, and the kind of expression that this gives where it becomes much more organic so maybe you can see it I can use this uh, pointer, pointer thing you can see me now <laughs> that there is kind of this pattern going down here and that's just that that small path of each layer where it, it's able to move completely um, so the way that was done is that each of the each of the modules were kind of unfolded into just like a clean strip that goes around each module and then I just hand sketches sketched like uh, <laughs> okay, your printer does that by itself. Um, so it's just like a hand sketched uh, pattern that goes along all of the different um, modules and then it connects like you see in this picture where you can see these wiggly areas of it is kind of this pattern that goes along all of the different modules and here you can see a close up, close up of how that actually looks where you have kind of the super clean layer by layer um, look and then in contrast to that you have this more uh, organic expression. Mm. And then onto the intersection of modules. So when the module said to me that it wouldn't just be like a flat on flat this is where the modules go. Um, and this is where I started going into this where it will start going going up and down. Um, so we're just not we're not printing just flat on top of each other. We're starting to do um, curvy curvy <laughs> What can you say endings to it um, and it's something that you would often see when you are 3d printing robots but not as much when you are 3d printing um, with like regular 3d printers delta printers or uh, call it yeah different kind of like desktop 3d printers um, but again by controlling uh, or by, by drawing the line um, it becomes much easier to actually control this or say I want you to go here I want you to go here. so this was some of the first uh, tests you have this module with your infrastructure and you have this top and then the other module will be able to go into that and then you can uh, you can erase that seam that you would normally see so you get these shadows uh, in between or between the modules instead of having like a flat on flat um, intersection to do this, to do these up and down motions, um, I will also show you a video in a while or a little later. Um, I needed to change the I needed to change the nozzle because when it's going up and down, there is a chance that it will start hitting uh, what has already been been printed. So, and I think that's another thing. If you like have a machine, maybe you don't have to build your own machine. Just become really familiar with the machine. Like the, the machine is your tool. And you should you should you know not be afraid to change things about it or do anything else about it. And the, um, the nozzle that you see the nozzle that you see here is made from the type of screw that you see here. So it's just pretty basic uh, metal work. And by doing that, you can uh, make make something like that. I got I had a little help, you know. <laughs> it's the it's the idea of it, figuring out ways to do stuff like that. Um, and also, this is the the wasp um, extruder. You see the nozzle inside of it, and there's this wooden screw, which actually makes it very limited how much material can come out of that extruder. Um, so that's another thing. In my case, I changed it, so it's not a screw; it's a drill bit that it's that's inside. So when you when you uh, start the motor, uh, a lot more material can come out. So you need uh, a little less pressure and it, that makes it there's just a lot of different things that would maybe go wrong that is not going wrong when changing these things around and I think 
that familiarity with the machine is really uh, yeah it's really <laughs> nice to have um so yeah and then another thing that you can do if you if you become more um yeah if you get into for example doing things with the with grasshopper or you yeah you start drawing the path and um, then you also see like how is the how is the key code actually uh, built like how what what does the key code actually do this stuff um, and it's just a lot of lines each point that the that the machine has to go to so another thing that i started testing was the extrusion amount um so that the extrusion amount would be kind of equivalent to the uh, set vector of each point and i will show you a video of this later but it's just another example of kind of the possibilities so what would normally be a normal uh, or like a plane cylinder with up and down going uh, inner kind of uh, yeah <laughs> motions is now something that starts to look completely different as you see here where you have these very organic new surface expressions that comes from playing around with these things um, again it's something that you can see uh, in the, the grass of the script for doing codes that i will give you a link for um, and now there's a few close-ups of a few close-ups of yeah, some of the things that can happen <laughs> when you 3D print. So you have something very controlled, but um, but this, for example, was a, like a little pocket of air, like going into the mixture, and then when it 3D printed it, it would just blow some of it out. And maybe someone would uh, take that away and be like, oh no, we need to make it smooth or something. But just letting it be is like kind of some of the things that that you that you get from this. Um, also, there is the ability for the blade to self repair. This is a print where there was an air bubble, there was a hole, but now you have like a small window that I didn't plan. Like I didn't have to design this. This happened that now you have a hole where you can actually see into the, the structure that is the behind of the, the outer shell. Uh, some other close-ups here. You see this, uh, yeah, some of these holes, kind of the extra dimension that it gives to the pieces. Um, again, some very dramatic <laughs> mistakes, <laughs> but that are kind of uh, no, that are kind of yeah uh, interesting in their own in their own way. These were all of the all of the modules before they were fired. So you kind of see like these are all the different modules. There are also some tests that were not a part of the column, but uh, just like okay, now we have all these modules, so you can then assemble the column and then you could take it apart again if you wanted to or if a piece uh, failed or something then you could just replace that piece and, and so on which is some of the things within for example design for just assembly which is something that is really, uh, investigated a lot uh, kind of applies into that kind of thinking and then i will not go into this a lot but of course the modules were fired i did a lot of glazing tests for the different um, materials that I that I tried printing with. Mostly it was just different colors of Danish clay. And this is uh, the column. And <laughs> now this was uh, the end of the presentation, but I will just show you some, uh, some videos here. Let me see if I can make this So let's see. This is my <laughs> my 3D printer in action, and the, you can still hear me, right? Still hear me? <laughs> yes, okay. This is my 3D printer in action, and you see the 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 nozzle here, which I made so that it was that it was longer, so you can have more dramatic up and down motion. And that's also just made from the screw. Um, then we have this, you know, how you prepare the clay. It's just like a little compilation of stuff from the from the workflow kind of. So that's a part of the process as well. <laughs> this is actually the only three components on my machine. And this is my machine, like the only three things that are moving. And here you see how it starts. This is a test. And then it goes into doing these up and down motions. And in this case, it would be uh, like this. This was the max I could do with this kind of nozzle. Like you can almost see 
like when it goes over here it can it will almost touch you see so that's that's for example one of the reasons building your own tool or changing the tool and so on is is necessary sometimes um and let's see oh that doesn't again. <laughs> And this is the one where it's, it's the same as before. It's just up and down going motions. But in this case, it has been told that if you go up or down drastically, you are allowed to give out more material. So in the, at the, at, for each point where it's going down or up, more material than usually will be extruded. So, you know, it's a... <laughs> It's testing, right? It's a trial and error testing, see how that looks. But that's something that you can start to play around with. Another thing that I was really uh, focused on was to have a setup that could print overnight. So this is me setting it and then going home, <laughs> being awake in my bed all night thinking about the 3D print. Bit. But you know, still you're not watching it all the time, which can sometimes be a little, uh, and there's just replacing. But I think. Um, I think in order for this to be a thing that will be applied, it needs to be, and you can see the self-repair also, the hole that is self-repairing overnight, it just, it needs to be this efficient kind of, you know, that the, for it to, yeah, for it to be applied actually. And then just uh, as a final thing in this one, I think there is just, me glazing <laughs> these large, large components like so, <laughs> and firing firing them for the second time. And that's how that looks. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alma. It was a very very interesting presentation. Um, I have some questions, but. Could we first go through the questions from the chat yes, section? Sure. So what do we have? We have, should I, yeah. We have, is the printer that you designed open source? It is. Like if someone wants to, like I, I did a model of the that I have in Rhino, if anyone would be interested in seeing that, I would also be happy actually to do like a guide on how to build a 3D printer like that. Especially because the only reason uh, I was able I was able to build my machine is because so many people before me did this open source, uh, you know, or had had kind of like this uh, mentality around things. And I think you are able to you should be able to share everything that you do with everyone, as long as people don't use it in kind of um, a profitable context. Like people shouldn't make money from your work, but people should always, if someone wants to, uh, to see the see the printer or get some files, and let me know. Uh, have you uploaded so it somewhere? Like, um, with the factory or not, not? Not at the moment. I did do a, I did do a retransfer link that I will just send you now. Um, and that, in that link, or you can download the recipe. I only prepared that, but I think we can just, uh, if someone wants to see this 3D printing uh, files as well, then we can do that. Or we can have another quick meetup or something. Ask more questions. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would also like to share <coughs> Jonathan Keep's uh, instructions on building a 3D printer because I think he dedicated like 10 years of his life on the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah, and his his main idea for the moment is uh, that you don't have to actually build a printer from scratch un unless you have some particular reasons mm. for that, like, like Alma did because of the size of the printer. Yeah, uh, but you basically convert a regular cheap uh, plastic 3D printer. Yeah. Check out the link I sent on the PDF document, and I'll also check your file. He's, he's very like like what he did is so comprehensive. Such a great guy. Videos talking about the electronics, building, everything. Like it's a great. I also think you should only do it if you're. I think it's fun. Build it. 
build a machine that you don't have to build a machine. Of course, you don't. Well, you can always buy one. But um, yeah, I I I think it can be fun to be able to do. <laughs> but, and it's not that hard. Like you think it's gonna be super hard, but you know you figure it out. You figure it out. <laughs> Okay, should we take uh, another question? Are you there, Anton? Yeah, uh, well, we have some more questions from chat. Another one was about parametric designs and uh, generating 3D print code from, from Grasshopper. Yeah. Well, I, I, I really hope we, we can have you again in our in our project because uh, as I already written in chat this is the first section an introductory yeah. one for people to understand what type of things we're doing and later in the next block of lectures hopefully it will be the second part of July but we are not sure of it yet we will have have more more technical oriented uh, lectures and uh, I know Anatoly Biroskin from Stoneflower 3D was also interested in giving a speech on generating G codes. So you and I, I, I personally have some things to share as well. So we'll for sure have this uh, block of lectures dedicated to to the actual 3D printing process, the more detailed yes. one. I I also think that uh, just uh, sharing different files. And like you can open them, you can look at them, try to see what is, how is it, how is it built? Like, Alma, I'm sorry, your your sound is a little bit skipping. Could could we try switching off the video because yeah. we're we're losing what you're talking about? And and we have another another question uh, from Simeon. Uh, how structurally strong this column is? I don't know exactly how it's going to I know that it's a long way, but a lot of ways to sum up, but I don't know exactly how it's actually going to be. We do it, we, we did have equipment um, to test things in the way you put your, your the thing that you want to test. Uh, in between, like a bottom, the top, and if you just start pressing down you know, on it, then, for example, anyway, but it means that the, the component that you test, it will eventually break um, in the test. Uh, when when will it break? Uh, I just didn't have uh, like the time to <laughs> destroy all my all my three D column modules in order to test. Structurally strong, um, but it, it can be tested. One day when I'm tired of the column, I will just destroy them all to see how strong they really are. I think. <laughs> so I hope that uh, partially answers <laughs> your, your question. Yeah, and there. Oh, and there, another... yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Uh, if there's any structural reason for placing the final product? No, there is not really. Um, there's not really a structural reason for it. Of course, it makes it, it makes it stronger. You can imagine that you have like, you know, like a super dense uh, glass uh, structure all around, what you already made. And when you glaze it and you fire it again, you also fire it to higher temperatures. So there are no, like, it was not for structural purposes that I wanted to place it, or for for the aesthetics of it, so to, to show that this is something you can do, you can play, you can place it, right? Um, which gives it this kind of this kind of expression. So it was all about testing, trying different things. Hello. I, I actually I actually have a piece with me right at the very moment, and it yeah. it answers the the question. Uh, if you glaze with a transparent glaze, uh, you could still see all the lines. But when you touch it with your fingers, it, it's completely gloss and, and, and smooth. So, um, well, personally, aesthetic, aesthetic uh, point of view is that uh, glazing 3D printed pieces with transparent glaze 
is, is, is actually a really nice way of uh, combining both utilitary functions and aesthetic ones because obviously like this is a 3d printed mug and if it was 3d printed uh, and not glazed inside all the all the coffee and tea parts would would attach to it and it would be really hard to wash it but if you glaze it and it becomes smooth it's totally usable so it's like not a mm. prototype but a final piece i will just go back to Here? Yeah, we could hardly hear you, but we see we see an image of what you're showing at the moment. Just okay. <laughs> but you got it. I think. Alma. Unfortunately, we, we don't we don't really hear you. Something happened to the connection. So maybe, well, it looks like we've, we've done with your part. Yeah, maybe you, you could just type a little bit and I'll finish the this webinar. Sure. Okay, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Alma. I, I, I would actually want to add one, one interesting thing about Alma's work because when she showed this uh, 3D print of the nonlinear um, extrusion, it is actually the case of, 3D, of the actual 3D printing because most of the 3D printing we know is not really 3D, it's, it's something like 2.5D because we're printing 2D over and over, uh, like layer by layer. But when you have this uh, nozzle going up and down, this is when you actually get the 3D printing, which uh, is not really common. Uh, most likely because plastics uh, uh, cool down very fast. And if you printed something, you could not actually push the material in again as, as what can be possibly done with ceramics. So this is kind of an interesting thing that could be done with ceramics that is almost impossible to do with any other material uh, available for 3D printing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all that I wanted to say. I'm really glad you came. Uh, please uh, check out the other event we have. Uh, the next lecture is uh, the day after tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Anna, maybe you have something to, to say as well? Yeah, thank you everyone. <laughs> so the next lecture will be uh, dedicated to coral reefs restoration uh, from Lydia Ratoy from Hong Kong University. It will be also interesting in, from ecological point, uh, both uh, like uh, maybe three D painting and some ecological challenges. So it will be extra, so uh, great as well. And yeah, next week we have also uh, two interesting lectures. So <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> so when the the Thursday election is about corals, right? It's a very interesting project because Lydia from uh, Hong Kong Architecture University, they actually printed a huge <coughs> tiles which, which are meant to replace dying corals on the Hong Kong shore. And they actually put them into, into water. And I hope Lydia will tell more about it. That's, that's a really interesting case of, of using ceramics for this particular, for this particular reason. Yeah, I think I think uh, we're uploading uh, the um, recordings of our webinars. Uh, we will post links to them in our Facebook uh, events uh, timeline. So yeah, you could you could uh, rewatch it later. Again, thank you, Alma, for your presentation. Yeah, great lecture. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.